So uh, how many people here are familiar with uh, SystemD's socket activation capability? OK, so about half. Um, the basic idea is that SystemD has a unit called the socket that is set up on the base system as part of SystemD. Um, and when it's configured there, when the system is starting up, SystemD listens on the socket rather than the application listening on the socket. And what that means is that the application itself doesn't have to run initially when the system is booting or for the listener to be available. Uh, I don't need the HDMI thing. I should be able to just hook up. It's over here. So one of the challenges that we work with at my company is we try to pack containers onto systems very densely. And one of the problems we were running into, uh, now that we're about 3,000 containers deep on a system, is we don't want to boot up a system and have 3,000 NGINXs have to start before the system is considered started. So what we've done is we've moved um, uh, NGINX and PHP FPM and some other related services to socket activation. Now, these applications weren't actually written to be socket activated originally, but it's possible to fool the application to be so being socket activated by using some of the internal facilities. So um, how many folks in here have used Nginx? Less mattering, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that it's an event-oriented HTTP server, highly scalable. Um, and, uh, but one of the neat capabilities it has, and this has become a kind of common design pattern of applications, is that in order to be able to support configuration reloads without restarting or without dropping the sockets and listeners, what Nginx does is it will start a subprocess underneath the current Nginx, and the subprocess will uh, load the new configuration, and System D will hand the current sockets that it's already listening on on the parent process to the child. The child will take over the sockets. Uh, and then the parent will go away, and then you have a child, uh, child Nginx that is now promoted to the master one that is running with a new configuration but the same sockets. And in the meantime, while the handoff has been happening, you might have had a little bit of a delay, but there's no point at which a, a connection wouldn't have been able to come into to Nginx and properly work. So there's no actual interruption in the ability to connect to it. So Nginx does this by passing through an environmental variable uh, to its child process that is just called Nginx. And it lists the socket numbers of what of the file descriptors that are getting passed into the child process. And of course, it has to pass in the sockets as well. But you can exploit this mechanism to make a socket activatable Nginx. And the same mechanism is possible with PHP, FPM, with FPM sockets as well. But I'll demo it with Nginx. Oh, uh, sorry, let me reconfigure the display. So let me mirror these. We good? OK. Are we? The, yeah, it's, um, it's not actually a 4 by 3, is it? That's fine. You can see what I'm doing. So uh, what we do is, um, so of course we have the Nginx process itself, um, which I think it's tailing. So uh, right now we have Nginx running on this box right here. So this is one of about, um, I don't know, let's see. So it's one of 2,419 Nginxes configured on this box. Uh, the, um, and of course, we don't want to have them all running on this box. Um, so what we can do is. Um, I can actually uh, exploit the, f uh, I can do this by, whoops. And then that is this Nginx here. So, oh, whoops, I'm not a. So what we do is we um, send in this here. So the way that um, System D socket activation works is you have a separate socket unit configured, which I'll show in a moment. And what that does is it starts sending in the sockets that System D has held onto and passed into the child, beginning at uh, file descriptor number three. Uh, of course, file descriptors zero, one, and two are your standard in, standard out, and standard er. So the counting starts at three, and it always starts at three. So the first socket you configure with System D is always passed in as three. If, in this case, we're passing in two sockets. Um, the reason why we're passing in two sockets is because 
we want um, Nginx to be listening on IPv4 and IPv6. And if you use a unified listener for them on Nginx, it does weird things with IPv4 addresses. So uh, we have two listeners there. So this first one here, listen stream uh, 10,000, uh, means listen on IPv6 port 10,000. Um, without this configuration item, bind IPv6 only, it would be listening on both v4 and v6. So we turn that off. And then we do a listener on port 10,000 for IPv4. So this gets passed in as file descriptor 3. This gets passed in as file descriptor 4. And then over on the service, we're configuring that so that Nginx receives this, um, this configuration right here. What Nginx does is when it's, it pulls this environmental variable down and iterates through it, and each time it encounters a colon or a semicolon, it considers a, del a delimiter. And then when Nginx starts up, it loads these in. And then what Nginx does is it examines these file descriptors that have been handed in and looks at the de details behind the socket that it represents. It looks at the IP address it's bound to, or if, if it's not all of them, the port that it's bound to, whether it's uh, v4 or v6, whether it's a Unix socket. And then it tries to match them up against the configuration for the Nginx that's loading currently. And if there's a matchup between one of the sockets that gets handed in and one of the listeners that's currently configured for Nginx, it will inherit that socket and just reuse it. So if I configure Nginx, as we do in this case, to be listening um, on, oops. So, um, if I configure it to be listening on port 10,000 uh, 10, for IPv6 and port 10,000 for IPv4, what it does is it tries to match this up against the file descriptors that have been passed in. And as long as that matchup happens, it's able to use them. And it's able to continue recycling them even through reloads of Nginx. Uh, so what I can do is I can do, I can actually stop this Nginx here. And now, if this is something systemd always tells you whenever something is like an auto mount or socket activated service. Uh, what it'll do is it'll basically say, you've stopped this thing, but there's something around that may bring it back to life, which is exactly the point in this, in this circumstance. So uh, if we check out the status again of this service, uh, you'll notice it's not running, but the socket, oh, whoops. Oh, wait. Tab completion is extremely slow when you have this many things in the box. Uh, so the socket is still listening. You'll see that it's listening on IPv6 and IPv4, but the service is not running. Now I can go back to my browser. Now this website right here, this is just the development site of my company's um, thing. I can reload that. And now you notice there wasn't really much of an interruption there, um, but I can go back here and we will see that it has socket activated, pulled in those sockets. And, and there's a reason why we can tell that it definitely is actually working. Um, and that's because uh, you'll notice down, uh, oh, we might have dropped that from the config. Um, but we, um, uh, we were running these with private network uh, true. Uh, the reason we had to disable that is because there is some other resource that Nginx actually has to talk to. But if the only thing you need Nginx to do is be a public web server and talk to Unix socket resources like PHP FPM, then you're able to actually just um, use private network for it because it doesn't actually need the capability to listen on those public interfaces. It doesn't even need to see those public interfaces if you're handing in that socket. You'll also notice up here, we're starting it with extremely limited privileges. It's starting as the user and group. I think it's actually redundant to be specifying both uh, when uh, this happens here. So, uh, even if you need uh, Nginx to listen on port 80, you could start it this way with limited permissions. It will never have root at any point in its startup process. Um, and then um, you can do almost exactly the same thing with PHP FPM. I'm sure there are other applications out there that have this kind of socket recycling ability where when they start up a child to reload configuration, you pass through the, the file descriptor numbers. And as long as you can convince the application to use this, the uh, sockets as if it were its own, then you can uh, use um, socket activation with Nginx uh, and PHP and things like that with systemd without any modification to the binary or package and still get that kind of isolation. Any questions? Cool.
um, soccer activation. And uh, as we already said earlier with the end spawn, and we have a soccer. Yep. So uh, what we've done is we've turned uh, the journal and the, actual, the rich field information in it and paired it up with Gelf, um, Logstash, Kibana, and um, Elasticsearch, which is, a, I mean, the, the Gelf, Logstash, Kibana, Elasticsearch is a pretty common combination and aggregation. But most people only are able to log two types of things. They're able to log things where they have the application uh, either pushing directly with GELF, which is a UDP-based, um, a UDP and JSON-based format that allows structured logging but is lossy because it uh, is only based in UDP, or they just forward syslog, which is not structured. So we've used um, the capabilities of the journal and its structured logging to allow us to, um, to find... Um, uh, to, uh, to include this information bundled in a way that is uh, reliably stored on the local machine because it's going right into the journal. But then we use a, a utility that we've open sourced called Journal to Gulf, which, um, we're, um, which uh, we make available here and is getting rewritten right now to work with the richer Python libraries that are shipping now with systemd um, to be using those instead of a sub-process calling journal control. And what that does is it sends in, uh, let's see, um, just looking for a good message example here. me. I wasn't really prepping for a demo of this. <laughs> yeah. 
So this is definitely coming through the library, though, where we can actually tell uh, when, where this is getting invoked. So you can see here some of the, uh, the underscore prefixed fields where uh, this is coming from a thing we call twisted log, which basically is something we can attach to a twisted server to log certain events that are happening in twisted to the journal. And so we can tell that these, are, these events are actually being logged by twistedlog.py on line 148 of our code if we wanted to do some tracing there of what's actually causing this. Um, the unit that's logging this is reaper.service, which is what we have analyzing the containers in the system and determining which ones need to be idled. Um, and we can tell the source host here. So I could actually go, I mean, with these, with these fields that I have in the log infrastructure, I can go right to my shell um, go to that host um, and do uh, and find out the status of, of that service. So um, not that I had any indication here that it was running having any problems, but if I did need to trace something on our infrastructure down to a single service on a single machine, I can do that. Um, the other thing that we do that's really neat is uh, we treat the service, the service status and unit status as part of our monitoring infrastructure. So we use uh, a system called Sensu uh, that is able to monitor um, all of the um, infrastructure that we have. And it um, notices uh, whenever we have even one failed unit across our infrastructure, which is pretty substantial considering we have um, probably two million units across our infrastructure. Um, and we started taking this really seriously in terms of the idea of these units need to be uh, in a state that's considered healthy. Well, even if they're stopped, we want them to be in a state that's considered healthy because that's a critical way for us to maintain quality control of the platform. So some things that have kind of gone into system D to help this is you can now specify the, um, the numbers and val or values you can expect for exit codes from things that are considered healthy exits. So some applications are a little misbehaved in terms of not returning an exit status zero, even if they exit successfully. That's an important thing for us, that some of them are configured now so that they properly know that, say, exit code one is still a successful exit from an application. Um, and, then, uh, this, uh, and then we also have been uh, pretty serious about um, uh, uh, integrating this into some of our sign-on stuff. So you've seen me sign into a couple of servers. The, none of those have any failed units, but if there are any failed units on the server, it's one of the things we print at SSH sign-on. And anyone who's extensively using um, systemd, I encourage setting it up so when you SSH into the box, it lists the failed units, because that's a great thing to see if you're trying to sign into a box to troubleshoot stuff. I think we have about 200 going to central logging. And then we, we've had to considerably scale this. Uh, it's a whole cluster of, of uh, elastic search machines at this point. And we can even see kind of all of this stuff is open source that we're using here. Uh, it's, only, it's not even been 30 days that we've had the new version of uh, Kibana in place. It's computing the graph going backward right now. So one thing that, we've, uh, that we just got landed in systemd yesterday is that um, slices are now going to be logging to the journal as a field as well. So if you want an additional field to be associated with resources on the system for organizing um, services, like we might have five different containers scattered over four different boxes for a given site on our infrastructure. And beginning with Fedora 20, we'll probably throw them into slices uh, so that that gets logged as a field that every site on any machine will be in the same um, slice ID across our infrastructure, which would allow us on our Kibana to search for anything logged by any resource for a particular customer's project across uh, our, our containers. Any questions? Or about any other system D facilities at scale? Cool.